Uh, good afternoon. I'm er Attorney General Eric Schneiderman, and I'm here today with my colleagues in law enforcement, uh, joined by Kelly Donovan, my Executive Deputy Attorney General for Criminal Justice, Perry Kadanoff, uh, the head of my Organized Crime Task Force, uh, Assistant Deputy Chief Christopher Vasta, Assistant Deputy AG Diego Hernandez, and Supervising Investigator Paul Grigorski. Uh, we are also joined by our colleagues from the New York Police Department. Uh, standing directly to my right is NYPD's Firearms Investigation Unit Captain Brian Gill. We also have with us captured Captain Robert Van Houten and Lieutenant Michael Jennings, Detective Ted Wenling, and Sergeant Louis Baez in the corner. Uh, this was a big case, and it required a lot of people. And I have to say once again what a pleasure it has been for our office to work with the NYPD and the level of professionalism and the seamless cooperation that enabled us to take down a very significant uh, uh, gun trafficking organization. Uh, we are announcing the results of a joint investigation known as Operation Midnight Run, which is, was a high-volume interstate gun trafficking ring. As alleged in the 196-count felony indictment unsealed today, uh, this ring imported dozens, and if they had not shut, been shut down, could have imported hundreds of illegal firearms from Florida to New York City that they then resold on the street for up to four times the original cost. Uh, our Organized Crime Task Force and the NYPD's Firearms Investigation Unit uh, jointly undertook this investigation, and we called it Operation Midnight Run because the defendants are accused of transporting the illegal guns on overnight buses from uh, Florida to New York. Today, we have indicted eight individuals. Uh, five are already under arrest, and we expect to arrest at least two others in the very near future. They are charged with numerous counts of criminal possession and sale of firearms. If convicted, seven of the eight defendants would face up to 25 years in prison. Uh, we have also recovered more than 70, 70 guns over the course of the investigation, guns that would have otherwise wound up uh, being resold on New York City streets uh, and, and sold to people who wanted to buy guns without background checks. The guns that were being sold by this criminal enterprise were not going to the legitimate sportsmen or people who were concerned about public safety. They were going to people who were very likely to commit crimes. And you can see that many of the guns are on display here today. Um, before I go further, let me say a few words in Spanish for our uh, Spanish language networks that are here. Uh, hoy hemos arrestado a cinco de una banda de ocho personas. Uh, están acusados de transportar armas ilegales en autobús desde Florida a Nueva York. Durante la investigación, recuperamos más de 70 de armas de fuego. No vamos a tolerar a traficantes de armas ilegales en nuestro estado. Uh, the alleged ringleaders of this group, as you can see here, were Natasha Harris um, and Quincy Adams. Now, Natasha Harris regularly traveled from her Brooklyn apartment to gun shows in Florida to purchase guns for resale in New York. Uh, Quincy Adams, who helped finance the ring's purchases, uh, sometimes also personally transported some of the weapons back to New York. Our investigation began this past spring and moved very, very quickly. Utilizing undercover investigators and electronic surveillance, we discovered that the ring primarily purchased guns from gun shows in Florida, uh, two in particular that are noted on the map here. And they were often texted each other pictures of guns uh, that were available for sale. Uh, an undercover investigator, as a part of our investigation, uh, was able to purchase guns directly from the ringleaders. And as alleged in the indictment, in less than three months, uh, was able to purchase 35 guns in 11 in-person transactions conducted in Brooklyn. Uh, the undercover conveyed to the ringleaders that he wanted to resell the guns as quickly as possible so they knew they were going to be resold on the street. Our investigation uh, revealed that between May and November of this year, the two ringleaders and other defendants made several New York to Florida trips, purchasing multiple guns at gun shows on each trip. The ring would then transport the weapons back to New York on discount commercial buses, frequently the Starlight Line, bound for Manhattan's Chinatown. 
Uh, for example, as illustrated in the poster here, uh, Harris, along with her grandmother and two young children, attended the Orlando gun show and the Bunnell, Florida gun show and purchased several guns at each show. Then, on the afternoon of October 26th, Harris and a co-conspirator met a courier at the Orlando bus depot and placed a purple suitcase, and the purple suitcase is right here, full of the firearms they just purchased in the luggage compartment of an overnight Starline bus headed to Chinatown. They did not have any identification on the bag, and this was a way of trying to protect themselves in case it was discovered. The courier boarded the bus on the morning of October 27th, and with the collaboration of our colleagues in the New Jersey State Police, uh, working with our midnight run investigators, we stopped the bus and an East Brunswick rest area along the New Jersey Turnpike seized the purple suitcase, which contained 33 firearms. We did this in order uh, to uh, do it in a private, quiet place and not on the crowded streets of Chinatown. By keeping these deadly weapons off the streets of New York, this operation has saved lives. What you see here are illegal guns that will never be used to rob or murder innocent New Yorkers. Our office, working together with our great colleagues in law enforcement, will continue to do everything in our power to crack down on the illegal gun traffickers who fuel violence on our streets. It, this operation highlights the very real danger we face in New York from the importation of out-of-state guns. Uh, and this is due, in part, to the very lax procedures at gun shows in other states. The city has reported that 90% of all guns used in crimes in New York City in 2011 came from other states. That's up from 86% in 2010 and 85% in 2009. And as we saw very vividly in this case, uh, guns can be purchased far too easily at gun shows in many states. Uh, in New York, uh, my office has created a set of model gun show procedures in cooperation with New York's gun show operators, and I'm very proud of the fact that the procedures have been adopted by gun shows all across the state of New York, ensuring that at our gun shows, no one can walk out with a gun uh, without getting a background check. As I said, these procedures were developed in cooperation with the gun show operators, uh, many, op many adopting them voluntarily after meeting with, uh, with people from my office. I've seen in person at gun shows from Saratoga, uh, to Rochester, to Syracuse, to Hophog, that these procedures run smoothly. No law-abiding sportsman or gun enthusiast is prevented from buying a gun. But what they do prevent is exactly what we saw in this case, and that is criminals going on shopping sprees for guns that they again turn around and import into New York and sell on our streets. Uh, to take the example of what we observed in Operation Midnight Run, Florida law requires anyone purchasing a gun at a Florida gun show to be a resident of that state. Yet, on numerous occasions, Natasha Harris, a resident of Brooklyn, was able to purchase multiple guns at Florida gun shows because no background check was performed. My office is committed to keeping New Yorkers safe, both by being tough on crime and by being smart on crime. Busts like this one uh, that we've carried out with our partners here today are a critical part of keeping illegal guns off our streets, but we also have to be smart by putting in place airtight background check procedures that prevent criminals from buying guns at gun shows in the first place. We've done that in New York, but we need help from our counterparts in other states because that's where the vast majority of guns used in crimes in this city are coming from. And with that, I'm pleased to introduce uh, one of our great partners uh, in this operation, Captain Brian Gill, Commanding Officer of the NYPD's Firearms Investigation Unit. I'd like to thank the Attorney General Schneiderman and uh, his investigators and prosecutors who work seamlessly with us. They worked around the clock, very responsive to our requests in this investigation. I would acknowledge the heroic work of our undercovers in this uh, investigation and the great work by uh, Detective Wendling from Firearms, Lieutenant Jennings, and Captain Van Houten all the members of the Brooklyn team, and Sergeant Baez of the Intelligence Bureau. Uh, all work together great, and we look uh, forward to working together again. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kevin. Uh, and uh, with that, uh, we'll be happy to take questions if you direct them to Andrew. Introduce yourself if you could, and let's do on topic first. Uh, Jake Pearson, 18. So you said that the, the Florida gun show operator seemingly violated Florida law by not conducting background checks for the straw purchase. Is that right? Is there, is there any potential case against those 
essential operators for selling to New York State residents? Well, no. As, 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 as I understand Florida law, you're not supposed to be able to buy a gun unless you're a Florida resident. But there is no requirement that you perform a background check. Uh, therefore, people can get away with it. It's sort of like a law without an, an enforcement provision. So they weren't providing IDs or anything? Like that? Uh, if you, you could show an ID, but no one would check to see if it was a real ID, a fake ID. No one would check. The key here is that we have a very effective system in place, the NICS system, this National Instant Criminal Background Check system, that in New York gun shows, we know because we have model procedures, everyone who wants to buy a gun has, cannot get out of the gun show with a gun they didn't bring in without having a NICS check. Those procedures are not in effect in other states. And we know, and we've known for a long time, that guns are coming into New York up what's called the Iron Pipeline from states to the south. This is a graphic illustration of that problem. Well, Tom Price from the Daily News. Just give us some insight as to the uh, undercover purchases, like where in Brooklyn they were, they took place in the back of the car, from the bus itself. Well, I, I don't think we want to get into a lot of detail about what happened. The, the guns were transported to Chinatown and then from Chinatown to Brooklyn, and uh, the transactions took place uh, uh, mostly in, in apartments. How did, uh, how did buyers know to go to these people's word of mouth, or was it an ad or something you know, online or social media? Well, Again, we don't want to get into the details of, of our undercover work, but our undercover operatives at the NYPD became aware that these people were selling guns, went in, and were tremendously effective at uh, uh, posing as purchasers, purchased a lot of guns, and uh, that's how we were able to uh, move our way into this gang. We used electronic surveillance, and we really wanted to make sure that we got everyone that was involved. We understood the full scope of the enterprise. and considering uh, all of these things and the fact that it involved interstate travel, uh, I have to commend the team. We did this very, very quickly. Well, I, I think the reason this is happening is that we have states where the laws uh, preventing people from buying guns for criminal purposes are ineffective. We know that the federal government attempted to close the gun show loophole and failed uh, last year. In New York, I'm proud to say that we've been able to overcome that problem. And uh, we have provided, I've provided to other states information about our procedures. I know there's some other states looking at them. It's simply really a matter of having both the political will and the understanding that you have to reach out to the gun show operators and get their buy-in, which we have gotten in New York State. This is not something that is, uh, was imposed from the top down. This is something we worked out with the gun show operators. I assure you that the vast majority of people who are firearms enthusiasts or hunters or sportsmen or, or selling guns at gun shows do not want criminals or people with serious mental health problems to get guns, and that's what background checks prevent. Anyone else on this? In the back, Aaron, go Yes. Uh, and, I, and I, I can't get into the details of, of how uh, we were able to get uh, our undercovers in connection with them, but there was information provided that they were selling guns, and uh, an undercover operative uh, contacted them, was able to convince them that uh, was, he was a good purchaser, wanted a lot of guns, and wanted to resell them, and that's how the, the relationship started, and over a period of time, uh, as I, I mentioned, in 11 different in-person transactions, uh, our undercover was able to buy uh, a lot of guns from these folks. I, un unfortunately, there are a lot of people who are involved in gun trafficking, and we see the same thing with drug trafficking, that do not hesitate to put children and grandchildren at risk by involving them in the process. Uh, it is shameful, but it's 
a fact we see over and over again. Uh, I mean, it varied some. Seven five, seven five it's it, it varied somewhat, but mostly in the se the seven five, the seventy fifth precinct. I don't know if we have a total number of trips, uh, but uh, we are um, some of the trips we had. Uh, I, we had people present to observe them. Some of the trips we knew about because of electronic surveillance. But there were three, three in particular that we really engaged with, and we got. And th those three trips were where we developed the evidence. Uh, and th through the guns purchased in Florida on those three trips, we were able to obtain the weapons that you see here today. I, I think the sa this purple suitcase appeared to have been used repeatedly. I do not know. <laughs> Uh, what particular qualities it has, but it, <laughs> apparently uh, if it worked once, they wanted to use it again. But again, the key to this is, and this is one of the reasons that we, we did have to do work uh, with electronic surveillance to understand exactly what they were doing. Uh, the ringleader, Natasha Harris, for example, might travel to Florida, participate in purchasing the guns, then would drive in a different vehicle, have a courier put the suitcase with no name identification underneath the bus, so there were these multiple levels at which they sought to protect themselves. So uh, this is not something that it would have been, uh, this is not a case we could have made uh, if had we just stopped somebody and found the guns. This is a case that required undercover work in electronic surveillance. That's it on this. Okay. Um, so, uh, you mentioned the Uh, I mean, I know the Star Line. I don't. I. I don't know that uh, there are any other lines identified. One of the. Uh, one of the bizarre ironies of this case is that Natasha Harris's legitimate job was that she was a dispatcher for a small bus company. So, uh, the uh, use of buses for transport, and we've seen how they tr thought that that provided them with protection, is something that uh, we are, we have been concerned with, and will continue to be looking at. Uh, yeah, I don't want to want to comment on anything that is, that is ongoing, but we are we are very much aware of what uh, what the potential is for uh, interstate transport. That is, that's a very fair point. We know that there are thousands and thousands of weapons coming in. It is a huge challenge to our colleagues in law enforcement. Uh, who have, We have done a very good job in New York of reducing the crime rate, reducing the rate of violent crime uh, in recent decades. But the, uh, the challenge for us now is to be as effective as we can at preventing the guns from getting into communities in the first place. So we are proud of the fact that our, our this was a very successful operation with our colleagues, the NYPD. Uh, I can't comment on other investigations, but this is certainly a pattern that we are looking at very carefully. They were cheap. I mean, that was, was 90 bucks. $90. No, this was one of the other things. This was, a, I think it was $90 uh, to get from Orlando to New York. So uh, this was a, a uh, look, they wanted to use a cheap bus line, which was much less likely to have people around to do any inspection. Well, you know, the vast majority is just handguns. It's a mix of an automatic, uh, small caliber, 9 millimeter, 38s, 40 calibers. Looks like it's a, an assault rifle, a mini-14 type Ruger, which is 223. 
And the, uh, the other weapon looks like it's a, it's a Mossberg 22 caliber assault rifle type uh, weapon, but mostly just handguns. No, no, you don't want to mistreat. No, no. This is and and uh, the the weapons of the weapons of choice, unfortunately, we've come to know of many gangs. Uh, so this is uh, what they were importing. It's a Mini 14, uh, 223, and that is a 22 caliber uh, Morseburg, I believe. Uh, and this one is a CP9. And that, that's like a like a Tech 9 type of weapon. I'm not sure what the model number is. That's a Morseburg, 22 caliber. And this is a, this is an AP9. Uh, the price would vary. Uh, we know they were selling them for three to four times what the purchase price was, and it would vary from a couple of hundred bucks to as much as fifteen hundred or sixteen hundred dollars. Well, our Charities Bureau uh, is the primary regulator of more than 60,000 nonprofit organizations in New York charities, and we have uh, a very aggressive uh, monitoring of charities. We publish information about charities. The one thing I would urge people as we approach the holiday season, uh, do not contribute emotionally because you get a solicitation. Please go to the OAG website and you can find out if a charity is registered in New York, if it's legitimate. Uh, we have found that uh, there are scams through telemarketing and online scams. There are frequently good intention people will give money to charities that produce uh, no results or virtually no results. Particularly, people should be wary of telemarketers. Uh, if you're interested in giving to a charity, you should go online, check them out, give to them directly, because the telemarketers can take an enormous piece out of that. We've also been very aggressive uh, about ensuring that charities spend the money for the purposes uh, that the donors intend them. We were after Superstorm Sandy. We uh, went after a, a large group of charities and published reports on the fact that they had raised a lot of money f to help Sandy victims and a lot of it was not even getting out the door and we forced them to provide it to the peop those people. So uh, it is the holiday season. There are a lot of people who want to give money to a charity. We urge everyone take a little bit of time Check out the legitimate charities. You can find out a lot of information on the OAG website. Every year we publish reports showing how much chari each charity spends on overhead and how much actually goes to the cause. Uh, and so we're just urging people to, uh, to give with thoughtfulness as well as compassion. Well, well, we have put charities out of business. We've taken some of the telemarketing firms out of the business for taking too much. We have j jailed heads of charities who were engaged in misconduct there. So we have a full range of options that we have shown that we are not shy about exercising. Anybody else? Okay. Excuse me? I mean, I, I, you know. <clears throat> Historically, uh, according to ATF data, it would be Virginia. Vir yeah, Virginia has historically been big. Uh, the Carolinas, uh, Aunt, Aunt Georgia and Florida, but uh, Virginia is, has historically been the, the, the biggest problem for us, which is closer. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Good job. Thank you.